welcome to the Genesis of U32. I'm happy here on this episode today to have a couple of my former teachers at um, Union High School District Number 32, as it um, was officially known before we voted on our name and chose U32. And um, today we'll be talking about the social studies department and how that was taught there, and but also about how did they choose to come to this school and their experience being in this high school at that um, time, opening in the fall of 1971. And Barry was there, Barry Kopetsky, um, on my far left, was um, there at the very beginning of the school, and Sandy Molman um, came the following year? Third or two years? year. Third year, okay. And um, very glad to have both of you here today. Was happy to see you at the uh, reunion for the first 10 years earlier this summer. And um, very, looking, very much looking forward to talking about this today. So Barry, since you were there at the very beginning, when did you first hear about this school in your job application process? I taught for a year in Iowa, and I knew I didn't want to stay there uh, because it was home. That's where I was brought up. Okay. And so of course you have to go somewhere. And my wife and I um, had never been to New England, so we said, let's go to New England. So we applied to every single school district in Vermont, New Hampshire, Western Maine, Western <laughs> Massachusetts. Uh, for our effort, we received one letter for an interview in Dover, no, Derry, excuse me, New Hampshire. It turned out they had no opening. They were just doing it as a courtesy. Okay. <laughs> so you, what do you do? You take to the road and you knock on doors. And we can, had. I'm sorry, can you tell me when did you first put out all those applications? Was it before this would have been April and March of 1971. So just a few months before the school was opening? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, interviewed at uh, Richmond with Ralph Barrows III, who was very proud that that school had just liberalized its rules so that men could have mustaches and women could wear pantsuits. And uh, I was glad there were no openings because I knew that would not be a school for me. I was not any crazy wild-eyed radical, but I just didn't like that kind of confinement. The school I taught at in Iowa was like that. He said, but you know, there's this new school down the road. You might try them. And their office was then in the old Plainfield High School. And so we just knocked on the door and showed up and Bill Grady greeted us in his way. And uh, we had what we thought was an interview. And we never applied to the school, understand, because it was not in the Patterson's Index. The Patterson's Index It was an index of all secondary schools in every state. Okay. So we never applied yet. to U32 oh. <laughs> or Washington Northeast, as it was known then. Uh -huh. And after the interview, uh, Grady said, well, you have a job. Okay. That's great. <laughs> so I went back home, told my principal, and uh, my, my wife was just graduating then. And we got ready to move, and it came to be May, and I called and said, do you have a contract? Oh, yeah, 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 it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And by late May, I remember coming back, I was fishing uh, after school, and I got a call from Al Stevens, who was the senior staff member yeah. of social studies. And he said, well, we'd like to offer you a job. And I remember being... Okay, I, I didn't say but. this, but I thought I already had a job. It turns out that was the real offer. Okay. <laughs> Bill Grady made many job offers like uh, mine. Okay. And p one of the causes of animosity in the beginning was that people who were offered jobs by Bill Grady really weren't jobs, and they were a little sore about it. Okay. And some of those people were also people who had been teaching in Montpelier and in other schools in the area. And they gave up Because they other hired jobs? nobody from the local area, save oh. one person, I think. The only one I can think of is Eola McAvoy in math. Uh-huh. No one else was a teacher in the local area. So the people from the local schools had applied? Yes. And they had been given offers, but then not actually I followed through I don't know the what contract. the nature, uh -huh. I, they may have been verbal offers in some cases, like what Bill Grady did okay. to us. But right. Okay. So that was the real offer. So uh -huh. of course we accepted it. <laughs> there was no plan to offer Russian in the curriculum. Uh, so your, I, your job offer was to teach social studies mine was social for the studies, full range, 7th through 12th grade? 7th through 12th. And, and my her, wife's was Russian. And her job offer when she first applied was to teach 7th Russian through and French. 12th Russian and French. Yeah. So that was added just because she happened to be coming and knew it. 
Because she knew Russian, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so Russian got added to the curriculum because, oh, there's an opportunity. That's kind of cool, it. yeah. yeah I mean, My sister was thrilled to take Russian. And I, 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 I understand that philosophy. I uh -huh. agree with it to uh -huh. a certain extent. Yeah. So we packed up our things and moved to Vermont. Okay. It was the only job offer we got. Okay. <laughs> so, and Al Stevens had already been hired. Is, yes. Is he still in the area? He's in Washington. He's in Washington. Seattle. Seattle, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so that would have been harder to arrange an interview. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, um, and can you tell us about your decision, Sandy, of coming to U32? By this time, it had a reputation. Um, uh, unbeknownst to me. Oh, okay. Uh, unbeknownst to me. I, I, somewhat similar to Barry's, but um, uh, I had been teaching for uh, two years in uh, Illinois, in Glenview, Illinois. And my, when I married my wife, who was also a teacher in the same school, uh, we honeymooned in Stowe, and we thought all of Vermont was like Stowe. <laughs> so naturally, why would one not want to come to this state and, and there? And uh, um, I was teaching uh, tennis during the summers, and so we were living with my parents in Connecticut, and um, I made a number of job applications, and by that time U32 was up on the registry. So um, I had applied and had one job offer uh, at a, a school in um, um, Brattleboro, but um, it was only to teach uh, um, journalism, which I had no expertise in and um, would not have paid anything virtually. Um, but then um, I think it was Al Stevens gave me a call and said, uh, we have an opening. And um, so I drove up from Connecticut and met Barry and Al and had the interview and then went before the board later and um, a answered uh, two very difficult questions, um, both of which I got wrong. Um, who would win between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs? And I said Bobby Riggs. And so fortunately, I was hired before they had played their match. Um, and uh, then was offered a job and came up and found a place to stay. And oh, wait, what was the other question? Oh, the other question was, um, you know, I don't even remember the other question because the first one floored me so much. I was all prepared to answer educational questions. And the other one was some obscure question, too, um, <laughs> okay. um, that had nothing really to do with education. Um, like, maybe, are you a good teacher? And I wanted to say, no, um, I'm just trying to fool you all, but I didn't. Uh -huh. um, and then... Uh, no questions about educational philosophy, no, innovation, no, nothing. nothing. And, 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 uh, I had those in my interview. You did? I did, yeah. with Bill Grady, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The board wanted, when I was there, to move on to more s substantive debates with the faculty. So hiring was a side note for them. Okay. There were other issues they were more concerned with really getting on to. Okay. Should we talk about that right now or come back to it later? Yeah, up, to, up to you. So, and your experience with the, with the board that was there originally. Yes. Did you interact with them very much? No. Okay. That's a simple answer. No. Simple question. Okay, so Sandy, what was your impression about what was happening on the board? Well, and, oh, I, and, and Tanner, before you go, yeah. the board was swamped at that point. Oh, yeah. The school was opening way up. over budget. Uh -huh. uh, opening was delayed because they were way behind on construction. They, they had Their hands far more imminent concerns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they could leave you to Al Stevens to worry about. <laughs> yeah. And, and, the, and the bigger issue that when I came in, was the fact that um, there, there were contracts, but there was no salary schedule. So uh, my first salary quote interview was with the then principal, Jim Dawson. And I went in and he offered me an amount of money and I thought, well, based on where I'd been in Illinois, it's on a contract, so a schedule. So I said, well, great, it's not very much, but I'll make do. And then I found out after I had gone out that another teacher who had less experience than me, I had had a master's at that time, got $2,000 more. And at that time, that was actually a chunk. And that was a, a chunk. <laughs> and um, I, so I, I think at that time they were negotiating with the board yeah. to uh, yeah. start developing a, a, a contract in a salary schedule. So was this before teachers unions? The U32 did not have a union the first couple of years. Did other schools have unions at that point? Yes. Okay, but yeah. U32 did not yet. Okay. What caused U32 to get a union was that they, the very first contract, quote, settlement, gave what were called team leaders 
a raise of something like 6% on like a twelve or $11,000 salary and gave the teachers a Wait, wait, the salary was eleven or $12,000? For team leaders. For team leaders. So $2,000. My teaching contract the first year was 6600 and I got a 3% raise on 6600 Uh-huh. And there were those of us who thought that 3% on 6600 wasn't quite equitable to compared to 6% of 12000 Twice as much so money, right, right. We formed a union. Okay. <laughs> what year was that that you would have formed a union? I believe it was the third year. Third year. Yeah. So I right think, you, you, I think you came right when all that was right. royal. Okay. Yeah. And there was okay. a one-day strike because the board had made attempts to negotiate with two of the team leaders on the side. They were they were novices too. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was not, you can say it was pernicious, uh -huh. but let's just yeah. Yeah. Okay. accept it as novice. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. interesting. So, you know, I've, I'm interested in this line of talk. Let's not even worry about the social studies department right now. Let's talk about Great. the history of the school. <laughs> so, um, when you arrived on Campus Barry, well, like, when did you find out, when, when did they tell you, you know, kids are going to call you Barry or ask you whether you, you wanted kids to call you Barry or Mr. Kopetsky? Because I, I, my recollection is when I arrived in the school, I had two teachers that I called by Mr. Grundy and Mrs. Yep. McAvoy. And yep. everybody else, I, if I recall, I, I, I mean, people like, um, you know, Mr. Dawson and Mr. Grady went by their um, surnames with the title. And I, I'm thinking that we called Jackie Gehagen Jackie when she was a gym teacher. I don't know if that like changed when she became a principal later. I don't know how that worked. I suspect that would have been the case, yeah. Okay. I think in most of our cases, it, it just kind of evolved in accordance with our natures and predilections. You know, I had been called Mr. Kopetsky when I taught in Iowa. Yep. I remember thinking, well, this is a little odd. But he's 18, I'm 24, I'm fine, <laughs> call me Barry, I don't okay, care. Uh -huh. but, you know, I, I so think he's it, 18, I'm 24, I can see that. But this kid is, you know, 13 or 14. Yeah. How, is that, how did that work for you for seventh graders calling? Was that just fine and normal? Just fine. In that period, yeah. yeah. Just fine. Okay. And, but you had to make a decision before the first day of school to know how you introduced yourself. So you kind of yeah, you know, I don't remember agonizing over that decision for more than a second. And there weren't a bunch of teachers having the conversation about it at all. They just all okay. I think it was natural that the older ones, and there weren't many, no, would have two that I know of stayed with what they, they were <laughs> yeah. comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, Eola, Eola McAvoy was by far the oldest teacher on staff. Oh, definitely, and yeah. and very highly regarded. Yes, I mean, Eola was when you good. say, oh, well, you'll feel closer to a teacher or this or that if yeah. you call them by their first name, I. I had a great deal of respect yeah. for Mrs. McAvoy, but I have to admit she's not the first person I would have turned to with a problem, though. Yeah. So there yeah. is that that barrier. Yeah. And I and I think the uh, nature of the uh, uh, teacher advisor system mm -hmm. facilitated some of that ease of of going into first names because. Uh, Good point. My yeah. recollection in the in the first year or that I was there, the third year of the school, students were only in class what, 70%? 60%. 60% of, of the time. And so y you had a lot of free time, and, and I remember doing a lot of meeting with kids individually and uh -huh. trying to get to know them and get to know their families and things like this. Now, was that specifically with kids in your TA or also kids from any class that you taught your that classes. happened to approach you? Um, both. Yeah, your classes, your definitely. Classes too, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was called, it was called a 60-40 plan. So, you know, in a traditional setting, you might have class five days a week, for, say, for 55 minutes. Well, you still theoretically had that, but only three of those were scheduled times. The other two were unscheduled. It was independent study. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we would call it, I guess, part of your personal learning plan. Okay. I mean, PLPs, or whatever uh -huh. name they go by now, uh -huh. are a direct outgrowth in my view of what we were trying yeah. to do in the beginning. Okay. okay. And we did not succeed that well. Uh-huh. So my, I were arrived in eighth grade, so I didn't really have a sense of how the high schoolers schedule was different from yeah. ours. So the seventh and eighth graders had um, tech one, two, three, and four, which was combining the sciences and math together. Um, and social studies may have just plain been it was social studies. Your course yeah, because yeah, I, I taught was. both seven yeah. and eight. Right, okay. Yeah. And then the English, I think I already had quarters at the beginning, because I think I remember having drama with Glenda Johnson for 
one semester, one quarter, mm -hmm. and then different things with different people the other quarters. So I'm not positive on that for eighth graders. But, um, but because I was in eighth grade, they made more of a point of having us schedule a little bit more tightly, a little less um, independent study time. Now, how, how soon do you recall it changing for the high school students? That they initially had the 60-40, and did that persist for a long time? I, I'm going to guesstimate that it didn't really happen until Jim Dawson left. That what didn't happen? Uh, moving off of that full 60-40. Okay. Right. And because Bill Grady was for a year, mm -hmm. Jim Dawson was for a few, I can't tell you how many anymore. Yeah. And then Lyman Amsden came in. And I believe Lyman went to an 80-20 or even more than that. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. my recollection, too. Okay, okay. Right. I remember having a lot of free time. You had. Well, and, 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 <laughs> and, there, and there was free time that, quote, wasn't free time because I had a number of students that elected not to attend any of my classes. And um, at, at the first year I was there, I was a little amazed because there, essentially well, there was no consequence to that. If, if you didn't show, you'd talk to the TA, you'd sometimes talk to an administrator, maybe a guidance counselor, but fundamentally there, there, there was wasn't no a test to take and they didn't fail anything? Oh, oh, oh they failed. Fail. Oh, they, they failed. Fail. Oh, but the, the philosophy often was, well, if a student is going to fail, that is his or her choice. And um, mm. it would be up to the student and you would try to cajole and talk and okay. meet with parents. Okay. And, and, it, and for a number of students, it was far more popular to go down to the smoking lounge, which was a very different thing, and, right. and hang out there. Right. And a seventh or eighth grader, if they had parent permission, could, I think, go down there, couldn't they? I don't remember I about can't remember seven what eight, was the I can't remember what was the lower end of that. Yeah. Um, hmm. See, in my memory is that, yes, class cutting was an issue. I don't remember it ever being that huge. Mm -hmm. Being of a little more cynical nature, I, I still kind of remember the conclusion that, well, uh, s some of them, I mean, you always try to engage every kid to the best that you possibly can, mm -hmm. but if they're forced to be in your class, I'm not sure how productive it is at certain times. So if they were there or not, right. the consequence in terms of what they learned that particular day or week may not have been that great. Um, I'm not excusing class cutting, right? Because I became pretty hard nosed about it myself later. Mm -hmm. uh, again, understand in the beginning of the school there were kids who did not want to be there, right? Because they had been going to Northfield High School, Montpelier. or they were going to be juniors and seniors in Montpelier, and even though Montpelier was treating them very badly near the end, not to paraphrase or use somebody else's phrase. Um, they did not really want to be part of U32. Their social scene was Montpelier, right. it was Northfield, and there were some angry kids, the older ones. The younger ones were far more excited. Yeah. But okay. the older ones were, there were some bitter kids. I knew that there were some bitter kids, and I knew that some of them like focused in on their music or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are some that never really wanted to engage socially within the school. And it was actually really wonderful that Montpelier invited them to come to their graduation, to their re reunions, um, the class of 72. So they had been invited with that right along. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. So my recollection of, um, of the free time is that you had pretty wide um, options for hanging out in the library and playing cards. <laughs> Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Which was developing some social skills and developing <laughs> relationships with people in other grades. I actually, I think that I had more friends in a wider range of grades than what a typical high school will allow yeah. if you were tied into classes. And since we're all in rural areas, you couldn't make those connections so well after school either. So, so there were benefits to that, but you also had the freedom to go and make the appointment with the teacher either about the thing you didn't understand or the social issue that you were having or you know, an issue with your parents, if that was an issue for a, a child, those sorts of things. So there was a lot of opportunity for um, relationship building with adults. So that you had more healthy adults in your life if you didn't necessarily have them from other places. Right, 
And I, and I think that was also, and, and Barry, correct me if, if you think I'm a little bit off on this, was one of the issues that divided, in some ways, members of the board, certain members of the board, right. with the faculty, because they viewed that as uh, that free time mm -hmm. as sort of wasted time, mm -hmm. and we're paying for it. Right. And, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm not sure that there was as much of a, uh, a concern for if students were having issues or problems, as there would mm -hmm. be today, mm -hmm. rightly so. Mm -hmm. um, but then it was like, you need to be in class, go to class. And, and, uh, but I know for me, the TA system, I thought was one of the strongest things because I developed very close relationships with kids, kept following them long after mm -hmm. they had left school and still continue with them today. Oh, ha uh ha. -huh. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure because I haven't been back in several years how that is still continuing. My guess is that it's probably a little more difficult because class time now is far more scheduled, not as much free time to continue that close uh -huh. relationship. Uh -huh. So for students that wanted to take advantage of that mm -hmm. and for students that had a, a degree of motivation and interest in being in the school, mm -hmm. it, I think it was a fantastic place because there was certainly a lot of talent there from a faculty standpoint. There was a lot of talent, um, right. Um, for others, not so much, unfortunately. Barry, you have something? Yeah, I had a group approach me. Uh, Ricky Barney, I can't, I, that's one name that comes up, uh, Rice. Norman, Norman yeah. Rice. Norman Rice and somebody else and somebody else. He said, but we want to read uh, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Said, okay, sure, I'll do it. Uh-huh. So he did it. Yeah. I don't remember how long, but so, you read, so he you read, read Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. It was was that in a classroom or in no, the independent no, it was time? off the table. Yeah. And you led some discussions or helped them? Sure. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't remember specifically. Right. It was just, we want to do this? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's a positive side. Right. And I think another one of those students might have been Frank. Um, um, Frank, Miller. Frank Miller. Frank Miller. He might have been. Part I of bet that he group. was. Yes. <laughs> who who <laughs> I remember being in my U.S. history class yeah. and wanting to draw all the time. Yes. And thinking to myself, well, Garrett he'll Hines. never go anywhere with Gareth this. And Gareth and, Hines. And he's laughing, of course, hysterically <laughs> right now if yeah. he sees this. <laughs> and right. Rightly so. Right. Right. I think another piece to put in the mix is lunchtime. Yes. The fact that we did not have lunch shift. Right. That lunch was just any other period of the day, and you could do lunch whenever you wanted to. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't this massive flux of humanity crashing the gates of the cafeteria line at the sound of some bell. It was easy in, easy out, right. sit wherever you want with whomever you want. Right, because you could spend an hour in there, there was no rush to yeah. get there as soon as that last class yeah. got out. You could go dawdle at your locker, stop by and chat with a teacher or a friend. There and was no faculty in. lounge, yeah. faculty ate out there. Yep. I think one of the sadder things that happened was, I don't remember when it was, I'll say it was the 90s, that they built a faculty lounge. Oh, that okay. was sad. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I think that the cafeteria was actually a really great place to um, have a lot of those interactions. Yeah. It was normal. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the people faculty do. sat with students yeah, too. That's what normal oh, people right, do. Right. I mean, you just sat and you down weren't and nervous. I mean, if it looked like the entire table was full of teachers, you wouldn't show up in case they were like having some kind of department meeting or something. But, but if you saw one or two teachers sitting where you could go up and just sit yeah. with them. And even though there were there were uh, thirteen year olds there, mm -hmm. as Barry was saying, it, it was <laughs> remarkable because here we all were young folks and and uh, there were also a large number I think at one point as many interns yes. as yeah. there were <laughs> teachers and often I had a hard time discerning who was who was a faculty member who was an intern and who was a student yeah. right right um, <laughs> and, um, and that made for some very interesting things also too it, in, in that sense it was a very exciting uh -huh, uh -huh. to kind of be experiencing that and going through that. Uh -huh. We had some great interns that came from the different programs. And we had some stinkers. But, yeah. Yeah. So I remember um, having the general impression of people saying, oh yeah, they got all these um, you know, young teachers they recruited from New York City, they don't know anything about rural Vermont, they're going to do these innovative, crazy ideas that aren't going to work, and nobody's going to learn anything. So that was like a backstory that yeah. some kids were hearing. 
but I was already a student there and I was learning stuff. So, uh, right. like, but I, that's the backstory. So, you came from where? I, I came from Illinois. Illinois, and you came from uh, Iowa. Iowa. So, not exactly New York City. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that, that impression did have some relevance. There were a lot of Boston area teachers. Okay. And some New Yorkers, yeah. That's, yeah, that's well, fair. and Boston, again, is not New York City. But, yeah. um, but as far as where the interns were coming from, some were coming from Goddard. And where else were they coming Goddard, from? Goddard, University of New Hampshire, yeah. okay. set us up as a, as a site. Uh, UVM in the beginning was kind of in and out and in and out. Okay. Uh, I think Johnson sent some early on. Do you think UVM was in and out because of the distance from Burlington compared to some of these other places or because of philosophical issues or I suspect a mix. You know, it might have mm -hmm. been some days where a supervisor came and said, no, we're not putting any of our students <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, at all, because again, UNH uh, liked us to to a certain um, uh, to a person who's coming in from the outside and and let's say just wandered in to see something. Again, there were no interior partitions, and so I, I remember and and we were vagabonds, because memory serves me right. We had no permanent home initially. Right, you, uh, had, you had a see, desk. Well, the very first year we were up in math. Okay, I think by the time you came, you know. Hennessy was free to give up territory. Okay, so, uh, but I can remember carrying a lot of my stuff around from yep. place to place. Yep. And you would have these temporary barriers of bookcases mostly and some uh, uh, boards, homemade uh, built uh, bulletin boards. And you rapidly developed the ability to uh, uh, speak over that if you wanted to be heard because uh, next door might be a movie being shown um, and you've got to be able to keep the students interested and in some ways that was a real challenging thing to do because if if you were dull and, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there were so many other distractions you were going to lose it pretty rapidly uh -huh. um, and so actually I, I thought for me that helped me to become a better teacher uh -huh. to really make sure that I had something that was engaging uh -huh. that hopefully would bring students in. Uh -huh. Thank you. And some classes were actually part of a hallway. So there'd be three so-called class areas and then the hallway along that. And kids were With coming in and out of class uh -huh. every 20 minutes because we were in what was called a modular schedule. Uh -huh. So some classes, your small groups would meet for two mods, 40 minutes. Your large group sessions, which we had in social studies, would meet for three months. Uh -huh. But every 20 minutes, Something there'd different. be kids getting out of <laughs> classes somewhere and going somewhere. I had forgotten about that ch difference in the length yeah. of periods. We're going to close up for this episode now, okay. but th I, we never got to talking about middle versus junior high and some other things. So l let's have another episode. But thank you so much for your time today, and thank you for joining us on hearing more about the genesis of U32. Thank you. Thank you.